lots of metal guys have been around forever, but Ace Freely of Kiss, he's up there on the survival scale with cockroaches and Keith Richards. Back in the summer of 83, there's a reason I remember it well. Ace's immortality was never more evident than when he survived an onstage electrocution. We were playing the Sportatorium in Florida. In those days, guitars were actually connected to amplifiers by a wire. You're wearing probably about 25, 30 pounds of stuff you don't normally wear, plus a guitar, you're trying to play it. His balance wasn't quite as good as, you know, some of us. So he loses his balance a little bit, he goes to grab the rail. I touched the railing, which was metal. I remember looking behind me, and he was flat on his back, holding onto the rail. The railing wasn't properly grounded. He was sizzling. Everybody in this group knows I almost died that night. Some fans actually cheered, thinking it was part of the show. I don't think people will ever really realize how close he come to dying at that point. If Ace would have fell forwards, he would have fell straight down two flights of steps, and who knows what would happen. We took him backstage. He was completely out of it. The ambulance came. They were going to take him away. They revived him. And he was still really dazed, even for Ace. And the audience was chanting his name outside. Chanting Ace, Ace, Ace. He said, I want to go out and finish the show. And we went out and played. And that's what rock and roll is all about. Ace miraculously returned and finished the set with no feeling in his fingers. The good side of him being electrocuted is the fact that it produced a Kiss classic, a song that came out in 1977 on the Love Gun album called Shock Me. Shock me. Oh, yeah. That was also the first time Ace ever sang lead vocals in Kiss. So I guess from bad things, something good happens, and it kind of sparked him into more of a role in Kiss. Shock me. They're the ultimate masters of metal marketing. But in 2001, they unveiled their most over-the-top creation yet, the Kiss Casket. I think it's so perfect because they're a band that refuses to die. Yet, they market the ultimate carrier to the next level, the Kiss Casket. Gene will make a buck out of anything. <laughs> The very special vessel was made available for a tidy $4,700. And I'm sure that there's ones that when you get in them, there's a battery powered speaker in the wall that will play Detroit Rock City as you ascend into your grave. I mean, can you imagine going to somebody's funeral at a moment like that and seeing the faces of Kiss. That's pretty intense. You gotta be, you, you deserve to meet him. If you want to die in his coffin, you deserve to meet Gene, I think. It's a great way to rest in metal, but in the meantime, the casket doubles as a fridge to keep beers cold for the living. The funniest thing about Gene pitching this as a part-time beer cooler is the fact that Gene has never touched alcohol in his life and will be the first person to tell you that. Yeah. We have a very strong ethical and moral notion about what's right and what's wrong. And what's right is to stay away from alcohol and cigarettes and drugs and not to take advantage of the capitalist system which is to say that anything that, that can have KISS on it should have KISS on it. That would be wrong. KISS has merchandised everything from coffins to condoms to candy. But you know what the one piece of merchandise that KISS fans want? Is a new KISS album. <laughs> it's like, how about that? This imposter from Skid Row reveals I fooled the world. We need Judge Wapner here. Welcome to my nightmare. It would have been the best metal riches to rag story ever, only it was totally bogus. In 1991, former KISS drummer Peter Chris was living a life of leisure when the star broke a story claiming the cat man was homeless. Basically what happened was this guy in L.A. hanging out underneath the bridge claiming he was Peter Chris. The Star Magazine got wind of it, interviews this guy. Doesn't fact check, doesn't do anything. Peter Chris, a homeless bum. I remember one of the 
the reporters called me and said, is this true? And I said, absolutely not, because I saw the photo. I said, that's not Peter. But they ran it anyway. Even Good Samaritans and KISS fans Tom Arnold and Roseanne were fooled and let the imposters stay at their home. I had a feeling that, that there was something up, but I wanted but, to do something. I wanted to do something for a fellow drunk. Meanwhile, Peter Chris is back at his Redondo Beach mansion with his Playboy Playmate wife, knowing nothing about this. So then what happens is they all went on the Donahue show and sorted the entire mess out. The headline, KISS star hits the skids. There's only one problem with all this. He's not the real Peter Chris. I picked up the star, and I remember talking to my brother about it, and he was like, well, he's bloated, he's been drinking, he's got, you know, and I was like, yeah, maybe it is Peter Chris. And I was a big Peter Chris fan, and it fooled even me. May I ask you now to kindly welcome the real Peter Chris. How you doing? <laughs> Why couldn't you impersonate like the Lone Ranger or uh, Tano or something like that? Peter Chris eventually sued the star for libel and settled out of court. But as Kiss always says, there's no such thing as bad publicity. Anything they write about you is all good. Look, Peter supposedly living under a bridge, homeless, Kiss are Satan worshippers. We couldn't come up with better stories than what people have come up with. So we just sort of sit back and go, that's showbiz. What do Gene Simmons, Ozzy Osbourne, and Mark Skippy Price have in common? A little motion picture called Trick or Treat. Metal gods are born, not made. That point was crystal clear in 1986 when the man who played renowned nerd Skippy from Family Ties tried to transform himself into a metalhead for the horror flick Trick or Treat. The premise of the story is a rock star dies and he is summoned back to life by Skippy from Family Ties and comes through Skippy's speakers and possesses him and Skippy gets in a little over his head with the occult and this dead rock star. You're getting into some weird man. And there's some real trouble brewing. He has to go to his friend Gene Simmons, the DJ, to save him. The storyline was metal to the bone, but not even Gene and Ozzy could help Mark Price achieve baseline metal standards. Gotta go. Ciao. It was a shockingly bad movie and they build it as starring Gene Simmons and Ozzy Ozzy. Born. I didn't know that Ozzy was going to be in the movie until I wound up on the set and there he was. I think Ozzy played a preacher. Those rockers really have a strange sense of humor, don't they? Well, I think they're just out and out sick people. Wake up, sleepyhead. I was offered the lead role of this rock star who dies and comes back from hell. And I said, I don't want to do that. And then he said, well, how about a DJ? And I always wanted to be Wolfman Jack, who was a legendary DJ. And uh, so I accepted the part. It's the sweeping sensation that's sweeping the nation, and I'm going to do it to you right here, right now. Wow. It was as bad a movie as you can imagine. These evil people have just got to be stopped. Ah! I love all penises, circumcised or not big or small, wide or thick. I'm not a size queen, I'm a talent queen. It must be tough for groupies when they've got to say goodbye to the metal penises they've known and loved. So one enterprising lady figured out a way to keep her favorite phalluses around. The infamous Cynthia Plaster Caster became the only woman to turn Rock's best bulges into art by making plaster casts of their penises. Cynthia's crafty little hands have graced the shafts of some of metal's most prominent peepees. I cast the Jimi Hendrix of the Jimi Hendrix Experience, Wayne Kramer and Dennis Thompson of the MC5. I made a plaster cast of my penis, but people who see it sitting on the table in my living room, they just think it's a thumb. 
The world of penile casting has had its share of controversy. In all the ego of Gene Simmons, he decides to write a song called Plaster Caster, so everybody associated Kiss with the Plaster Caster when she never cast any of those guys. reveal who was the biggest? I think Minnie Jean would be the biggest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like some kind of Smithsonian of the schlong, Cynthia has done a lot to preserve some important pieces of metal history. It's a great idea, I guess. I mean, metal's always been a little left to center, and making casts of rock penises is about as left to center as it gets. had been known to be a real rebel. I just remember she had great knockers. Wendy O was awesome, and I, I really think that in her lifetime, she certainly did not get enough credit for breaking the rules. The late Wendy O. Williams earned an honorary set of cojones for the groundbreaking mayhem she perpetrated in her 1984 video, It's My Life. This is the first time I ever saw Wendy Williams. You know, I, I was saw the video and I was like, oh my God, look at this. All I can do is what I feel. The video featured Wendy doing her own stunts, like bulldozing a house, wrestling two chicks, and jumping from a moving car onto an aircraft. She was risking her life in this video. There's a plane that comes by and drops a ladder down. She climbs up the ladder, and right, right as she's climbing up the ladder, the car goes over a cliff. And that's not a stunt double, that's her. I wouldn't have done that. Paul and I wrote It's My Life. Wendy was the real deal. She didn't pretend to be anything else. She didn't go to work, now I'm a metal chick, now I go home and I watch Bugs Bunny. No, no, she was the real deal. Kiss was always obsessed with outer space. I'm just a wild, crazy kid from the front of you know, that saw a spaceship one day and uh, went all haywire. The gravity they used to hold it down just don't exist no more. He wrote songs about the final frontier and his dream of one day exploring it. No one knew that his lifelong dream had come true until Ace took to the radio airwaves in 2002 and told the world about his personal encounter with a UFO. Ace came on my show and talked about how aliens landed in his backyard. Yo, Ace! Eddie! What, what are you doing? doing? I had an alien ship land in my backyard about two <laughs> weeks ago. You think I'm kidding? You're gonna think I'm crazy? There's nothing new there? I do believe it. I believe in aliens, and if anybody was abducted by aliens, it was Ace Frehley. I woke up on the floor, my, my German Shepherd Elvis was like licking me, and there was a circular burn mark approximately 27 feet in diameter. I remember it vividly, taking off. The story fits with classic abduction um, history where um, the abductee can't remember how they got from one place to another and it's a uh, loss of time was no delusion. He told me that he communicates with beings from another planet that live outside his house. Are you going to go see George Bush or are you going to go see Ace Frehley? You're an alien. If you want to hang out with Ace and talk about the smoking guitar. Lots of people doubt Ace's story. You have to put things in perspective. Perhaps because it's missing the usual details about anal probes. Ace believes that Elvis is still alive, that Hitler's running around someplace, and that there's a CIA secret mission to go and get him about what nobody seems to know. In 19... 
1983, the mysterious masked men of KISS did the unthinkable. They revealed their true identities live on MTV. After 10 years together, we are going to see KISS without their makeup for the very first time. The makeup maneuver didn't exactly sit well with the KISS Army. It was good for the first, like, five minutes. And then it was like, why are they doing this? I remember seeing them without their makeup, and I was kind of bummed and wishing they would have had their makeup on. But thankfully, the transformation wasn't permanent. In 1996, after 13 long years, the guys delivered another magic moment. KISS remasked. Once again, Metal's planets were properly aligned. Ultimately, it made great sense to put it back on. Well, they had to. You see what those guys look like without their makeup? For a few years there, I looked like the ugliest girl I've ever seen. It's like, when you want to see Kiss, you want to see him full makeup, spit blood, the fire. What's great about Kiss is how they've reinvented themselves so many times. They're like the Madonna of Jewish guys that wear makeup. The 1980s were a perfect storm of metal, and at the epicenter was L.A.'s Sunset Strip. This scene went largely unchronicled by metal anthropologists until 1988. Do you like heavy metal music? Yeah. When director Penelope Spheris gave us the film, The Decline of Western Civilization Part 2. We are not role models for your life. I'm an anthropologist, I like to think, and I like to document these movements, just mostly for historic purposes. It seems surreal that there would be a music scene like that, but that's really what it was. And it was like that movie, but bigger. The documentary featured metal wannabes, up-and-comers, and legit stars, all captured in their natural habitat. This is the way you want to live, then you can live like this. So I asked Gene Simmons where he would like to be filmed for the movie, and he said, I want this to be really classy. And I said, okay, Gene, you call it. Where do you want me to shoot you? He said, trashy lingerie? Six. And rock and roll, the American way. Every girl that came in there, he asked them if they would go to bed with him. I mean, it wasn't like, would you go out and have dinner? Would you sleep with me? I remember being a whore and trying to pick up at least two of the girls. The metal movie was really an eye-opener because it wasn't just about the fun part of metal, it was about some of the more dark experiences of some of the musicians. And the one part that nobody can ever forget is Chris Holmes of Wasp in, in the swimming pool with his mom sitting on the side of the pool and he's just drinking vodka the whole time. I'm a full-blown alcoholic. I remember looking at that and saying, man, I don't want that to be me. Okay. A lot of us that were in that movie might look back at it like, well, okay, I do, as a skeleton in the closet, like, oh my God, look what I used to look like then. If you want to come here dressed really nice, that's okay, but you'll get in the club faster if you dress really cheap. We looked goofy, and it was a decade in time, but you know what? At the risk of sounding like a, a relic, those were great times back then. If you weren't around, you'll never understand. Rock and roll forever! <laughs> That's a cut. It's no secret that back in the day, metal stars nailed a lot of chicks. And Gene Simmons was among the boning elite with some 4,600 partners. Oh, girls! $46 million dollars and 4,600 women. Not a bad life. 4,600. That's what Gene claimed in his 2001 biography. Yes, I like sex. More is better than less. All that booty earned Gene the nickname King of, well, let's just say it's a pseudonym for kitty cats. Wow! That's what he thinks he is. He got him the P word. 
Why not let it be? Yeah, we've seen the tongue. I'm sure that's yeah. speaks for itself. Wow. What am I living for? For girls. What are you living for? I mean, ultimately, I want to get off the stage, go back to my hotel, and do the encores. Don't you? Get Polaroids of his conquest. You know, pretty much the way a tourist does. If you've been there, you want a photo of it. So I've taken a photo or two in my time. You know, if I was a chick, I'd be like, dude, can you leave the makeup on just for me? <laughs> well, because now that would be a sexual experience, like the boots and the. That would be pretty crazy. <laughs> hey, Jean, what are you doing? <laughs> God, give me some of that. Jean's record just goes to show how metal can transform a guy born high on whites into an infamous humping machine. I don't care if you're better looking than me. By the end of the night, I will get your girlfriend.